Thanks everyone for coming. My name is Omer. I work at NVIDIA. And with that, I'm going to take the badge off because you know my name. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm an engineer at NVIDIA, actually. I wear many hats, uh, but my uh, title based on what people are expecting to see out of my work is designer. I write code, but the code usually translates to things that involve humans operating something or humans reacting to a thing. So it started out by doing VR. I, I've been making VR for a few years. Um, it also comes to um, interacting with computers, abstract computers, as in things that don't have a mechanical response to you, and also things that do have a mechanical response to you, like robots. And you know, robots have been growing a lot in recent years. We, we, we have now um, a proliferation of robots that we all know about in you know, autonomous vehicles, in industry, uh, autonomous aerial vehicles. I just read this morning that Iceland is starting um, an experiment with delivery drones. Um, and, you know, there's an explosion. There's also an explosion in tools. Recently, um, NVIDIA has released um, this toolkit called Isaac. It's, um, it's a toolkit for robotic control. Um, there, the, we have some low-level tools for operating, you know, any kind of, any kind of robot using our uh, multiprocessors. Um, it also has tools for simulation inside. And actually, the image that you're looking at right now is um, one of our first experiments in Isaac. It's um, a lot of robots, a lot of PR2 robots, um, and they're actually modeled to be PR2 industrial robots. Th this, is, this is the real thing. Um, all being simulated on playing hockey at the same time. They're learning from scratch, essentially. So there is a reward function here that lets them know when they've hit a goal. All they have is an input from a camera. In this case, it's a virtual camera, but we don't mind. We, we make virtual cameras, we simulate them to think that they're real cameras, and the robots are reacting to what they see and trying to hit the goal, and eventually they will. Uh, this has been, we, we worked on this, I guess, for two years now, um, and we, we showed this at uh, GTC 2017, so that's a year and a half ago already. Um, and we were, we were quite happy with the fact that we can get a virtual system completely separate from a human um, creating real results, right? These, these would translate to motors on robots, and the motors on robots would then do the right thing when it comes to uh, interacting with a completely humanless environment. But that's not the environment we live in, right? And most of our lives, we will be interacting with robots in the next few years. And that's a problem, right? Because engineers are very good or are very used to and like the environment of not having to deal with human consequences. I would like to prepare the robot for max maximum operation, right? Like, be the most intense that it can be, do the thing as fast as possible, and not really worry about, you know, people getting in the way, scaring things, scaring pets. Um, you know what, actually, before we dive into robotics, I wanna get to know my audience. How many of you um, consider yourself working inside robotics? Okay, great. How many of you consider yourself working inside VR, the field of VR? How many of you consider yourselves designers? Engineers? Management? Anything I skipped? <laughs> um, how many of you have formal training in human-robot interaction? That's a trick question, really, <laughs> because Human-robot interaction hasn't grown as much as the rest of robotics, right? We have a degree here and there, basically, for um, the field of human-robot interaction, but we don't have a discipline. And we don't have a discipline because there's no way to start testing your work. And usually when you're a designer, you want design tools. Um, you don't want to write a design spec and have um, some engineer look at it gloss over it and attempt to do the best and a few months later see the result and see that it's not exactly what you expected. You want fast iteration, you want, um, you want to see the results or see the preview of the results live almost. You want user feedback. You want to predict what the robot is gonna be like. Basically what I'm saying is you want all the tools that every other designer in every other field has 
but human robot interaction designers don't have them. This discipline doesn't exist, so we had to invent it, essentially. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying this with great respect because this field has existed for many years. Um, you, you will see conferences in HRI, but it hasn't existed the same way that we talk about VR designers. So VR designers haven't been around for that long, but they have a lot of tools now. The tools aren't ideal, we're working on it, but we thought as we were working on um, a simulated environment for robots, we're, th we're thinking if engineers can have all the access to these tools, it's just Unreal Engine, it's just tools like Unity, Unreal Engine, th things like that. Why not have designers have the same access? And part of the reason we can't have the same access directly is because we don't have a clever way as designers to program behavior of robots. And we set out to solve that problem. We wanted to enable people who are somewhere between engineering and human factors to study how robots behave when interacting with humans. And we did a series of experiments to show that we can do that. Um, so let's start, about, let's start with the first one. This is something that we released at uh, SIGGRAPH 2017. Um, the prompt that I got from uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen, was, um, hey, we really want to show something that works with deep learning and, um, and VR as well. And you know, the first instinct for me was, well, VR is very visual, v VR is very visual. deep learning is an inherently visual field as well. Um, can we make some kind of network visualization? And that's, that's boring to show in a demo, really. Um, and we started looking into robotics and how we can um, test which part of a robot can manifest its behavior, or manifest its intentions, or its visual field um, in, in, in virtual reality. And we got some really good, interesting um, ideas. One of the ideas was we take a very simple set of actions that a robot can do, for example, play dominoes, and try that in virtual reality. And if that works, try that on a real robot. So this was actually a really complicated project. We did it in two and a half weeks. Um, we could only do it in two and a half weeks because we had all the tools that we needed to do it in two and a half weeks. Um, we had six teams. I was running four of them, I think, um, or maybe three of them. And they were in 10 different locations. I live in New York. Um, some of the team was living in LA, Vancouver, Toronto, Austin, all over the world. And it was running eventually on three computers, uh, one computer for the actual robot, two computers for, um, for the VR and AI systems. Let's talk about how it works. So here's the idea, and here's the problem that we have. We want to use VR interactively with machine learning. And when I say interactively, I mean don't look at a machine learning system and observe it actually try to modify it, try to intervene with its actions, right? Because we want to debug um, the AI as we're running it. We want to discard all the irrelevant baggage that we have in, um, in robotics up until now because for many years, the tools for building robots were not as interactive and were not as, um, as let's put it this way, intuitive. Um, if, you've, if you're um, a graduate student in robotics, you're likely to be using a system called ROS, which is Robot Operating System. Um, it is uh, a command line based system. Um, they're, they're, it requires a special expertise. Every robot builder has an API that they ship to that, to that robotic system. Um, and it's, it's pretty much considered a research tool. Um, if you want to use a simulator with that, you use a simulator called Gazebo, uh, which is far from real time um, and is very non-visual. So we wanted to change that and use the actual tools that VR creators build with to make a robotic system. The second goal, sorry, the third goal was to create an end-to-end -end task without end-to-end -end training. And what I mean by that is um, if you look at reinforcement learning or machine learning fields that are now used for AI, um, many of the ways of programming robots would be, here's a set of inputs, here's your set of outputs. Now work it out. And this, this work it out phase is why we make a lot of money now. Uh, it's, we, we, put, we put a lot of, a lot of computing efforts into, into making uh, reinforcement learning work faster. Um, 
there's multiple ways of doing that. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking about them here. And we really wanted to show that we can do this in two weeks. So let's talk about how we do an end-to-end -end task without end-to-end -end training. I think this is my water. I, I just found a water here. I'm gonna try this. Okay, so um, in order to make a task where a robot sees an image and then acts on it, we really need three components. We need to make sure that the robot understands what it sees, we need to make sure that the robot understands what it wants to do, and we need to make sure that a robot can then act on that understanding. Typically, uh, with an end-to-end -end system, all of these are programmed to be one thing, as in, the robot's motions, the actual motors, are connected directly to what the robot sees. Of course, I'm, I'm simplifying this, there are other ways, but this is the kind of uh, method du jour of, uh, of, of reinforcement learning nowadays. And we wanted to simplify that a little bit, so we built all of our tools inside Unreal Engine and Holodeck, which is our internal system for VR. We made um, an image generator that creates a lot of sets of dominoes um, and just tags them, gives them tag to, to um, a deep learning system that just sees, all it does is sees. It doesn't care if it sees something inside a game engine or it sees something in the real world. All it cares is that it gets an image of dominoes and it can tag it. We built the next system, which is an abstract gameplay network, to just be playing dominoes. It doesn't know what it, what it saw at all. All it gets is a graph of dominoes on a table and returns what the next move is gonna be. And we trained that on um, about 80,000 games using a uh, rule engine. I think 80,000 games, don't get me wrong, don't catch me on my stake here. Um, just using reinforcement learning, right? Play a game, get it wrong, play another game, get it wrong, 80,000 times, eventually you get it right. Don't try that. Um, and we built our third system separated completely between uh, the VR world and the robotics world. We just made a robot um, move around based on the instructions that we got, and the same robot would move in VR because we have literally the same model of the robot and we have literally the same inverse kinematic system and everything that the robot is doing in VR, it can also do in real life. So our first move was then to test it in VR. And this is what the gameplay looks in VR. Look like in VR. We have a um, cute uh, model of, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a Baxter robot. We just replaced its head to look cuter. And um, the user have, has their own set of dominoes here. You'll grab a domino, um, place it on the table, and as the user places it on a table, it also signals to Baxter, um, actually we call it Isaac, but the robot is called Baxter. Um, we signal to Baxter that, the, that it's his turn, and the robot will think a little bit. Oh, the sound is really loud. Can you turn it down a little bit? Thank you. Um, so the, the robot then uh, makes a decision and plays a brick. And you'll see that the errors, we're deliberately showing something with a little bit of error here. Um, there are a few errors here. The first error is in the detection, right? The robot hasn't detected the exact position of the dominoes, so it put it a little offset. But it's more or less doing the right thing. It is, it's looking at the, um, at the tiles, it's placing the tiles in the correct place, and it's doing it completely regardless of it being in VR. It doesn't know that it's in VR. For all it cares, it has a bunch of inputs, it has a bunch of outputs, and what we're seeing here is what the robot would act like in real life. And check out what we're actually testing here. We're, we're testing if the robot is safe to operate, right? If it has the motion bounds that won't punch a human. We're testing if the inverse kinematics doesn't go through the table. Um, we're testing if it's correct. We care about that a little less when we're testing, sa when we're testing saf safety, but correctness is kind of important in programs. And we're also testing if it's fun. And um, on the Friday before SIGGRAPH, <laughs> um, we got all the systems working, uh, and we decided that it's fun enough to show. Um, this, is, this is, I think, what is it? 24 hours before we were supposed to set it up at SIGGRAPH, and we got to SIGGRAPH, click, um, and we set up the robot, and nothing was working. Um, and we were trying to figure out why nothing is working, because, because this, the, everything worked in theory, which is a great catchphrase. Um, and looking at the system components, we found the camera, 
was rotated 90 degrees to the left. So we just rotated it back and it started working. No debugging live, it just the robot started playing dominoes without ever seeing that table, without ever having tested those controls, and it played it safe. It didn't harm any humans along the way. We did put a line there just in case, you know, uh, we, we wanted some safety. The robot played dominoes the right way. Let's, let's, I'm just gonna wait here until it manages to put the, place the domino brick down. There we go, yeah, nice, well done. Um, so yeah, so this was the first experiment and we, we more or less, we were rather proud of it. So to sum, summarize this, it took two and, two and a half weeks. We used 30,000 generated images of dominoes. These are all generated in real engine. We exported the data, moved them into machine learning. We had it play 80,000 games. The components were never integrated until deployment. I said the Friday before SIGGRAPH and the teams were all physically separate. In fact, on Friday, I was in New York. Um, and testing this in VR while the deep learning engineers were in Toronto, uh, modifying parameters while I was in VR playing with a robot, which is really cool. Um, just because of curiosity, I put up the production timeline and I know this is the, the right production timeline because somewhere between day five and seven, I went into surgery and came back and ran the rest of the uh, production from bed and still manages, managed to get this done. And this is not because I'm amazing, it's because the tools are just simple enough nowadays to do that. And we can do that remotely. Um, so here are the main takeaways. We built a robot that looks like a five-year-old. We put it inside a classroom. It does this. It is very courteous. People act to it like it's a five-year-old. So they don't expect much from that robot. And this is really important if you're building a system that humans should interact with on a high level. We should really build a character there. I mean, if you're game developers, this should be a no-brainer to you, right? You build the sort of character that you want the user to interact with. Um, the game mechanics are a very powerful way of, of avoiding failure states. Um, that's why we had it play dominoes, so people know that they don't have to stack dominoes or things like that. The, games, the, the game rules were clear and the robot could play them just as well as the human could play them. Th those are called, if you're a board game designer, that's called a handicap, right? Um, so obviously we were modular and it helped iteration times um, and remote tools were precious, always use them. Um, so we were there, we, we proved HRI, you know, is, uh, is a system that can be done in VR or like a practice that can be done in VR. Um, we wanted to, know, wanted to look at what we could do next um, that is that cool or that interesting um, and develop our tools further. And we um, tried another experiment and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed for, to, to do this in Germany because a lot of people will catch me on mistakes here, but we made Isaac tie pretzels. <laughs> Um, and uh, let's talk a little bit about what the complexity of that and why we, we're, we're choosing to do that. Um, the first thing that we wanted to do um, in, in showing that we can tie pretzels in, in VR using a robot is we wanted to do bimanual robotic arm manipulation. I'm, I'm gonna do this at, with one hand at a time because I'm holding a microphone, um, but it's actually very special that you can train a robot nowadays to use two actuators to do something. We wanted to show um, our system, our physics engine. We have a pretty good physics engine called Flex, not to be confused with PhysX, which is our rigid body physics engine. Flex is a soft body physics engine. It can do fabrics, can do fluids, can do lots of particles. Um, and we wanted to prove that the um, experimental robot that we have, which is actually a very cheap robot, can do soft body manipulation. And that's, that's, in robotics, that's a holy grail. Like even, the state of robotics right now is that folding a towel is hard, really. So um, think about um, tying a pretzel. That's gonna be a nightmare for a robot. Um, and I kind of glossed over our physics engine um, here, but I wanna talk about it a little bit. So we have a tool called Flex. Um, I feel like it's not well understood in the community in general. Um, it's a tool that, that does fluids really well in games and cloth really well in games. Um, but I feel like it should be the go-to tool for uh, interaction in games. And I'll explain why. If you're in VR and you're moving a box around of this size, in order to trigger an event, 
this is all you're doing, it gets kind of boring. This is not reality. In reality, we have finer things, right? We're used, our fingers can articulate in a very fine manner. We're used to manipulate stuff like cloth or sand. And we have a difference between, we have a difference between semantic operation of a thing, as in I've turned the light on, and moving stuff around, which isn't always semantic. I can do this, or I can do this. And I've already done something more complicated than a VR system can do right now, right? So, <laughs> fluid-based physics engine is actually the way to get there. So we wanted to test that, and uh, we built um, a simulator um, for any person to tie a pretzel. You start by going in, you have a, like, you, know, you see that Isaac has a little friend called Euclid now, gives you an instruction to touch the hat. As you get handed the hat, you transform into the robot, first person. Now you are controlling the robot. And you'll notice that something is special here. You have these green bits of controllers, and they sometimes turn red, and you have uh, the actual actuators. And what's going on here is that we're giving the human an indication of where their actual controller is, but it's not where the robot arm would be. Humans are constantly doing things in illegal states in VR, right? We have Reality Prime, this is where we are, and we also have Virtual Reality, which is where we want to be. We're moving the robot arm to the right position, and sometimes we get it right. Sometimes it's impossible to get there, right? So in this case, over here, the, the controller just turned red because the inverse kinematic system of the robot arm was not able to solve the position where the human wanted to be. And when I say not able to solve the position, it means also maybe not safely able to solve the position, as in it might have to go through the table. So after the user is done doing this, um, they get a replay of uh, their tying a pretzel. And you can see here that many of the inverse kinematic systems uh, of the robot do things that humans don't t typically do, like put their hand up to turn it around. Then uh, Euclid, Isaac's friend, comes over, does a salt bay move on the pretzel. I'm very proud of that. Um, and bakes the pretzel. I, now, I, I, like, I know we're in Germany. This is not how you make a pretzel, I get this. Um, but this is the best that we could do in, in the time that we had. Um, so we learned a bunch of things from this. Uh, let me skip these. This is in case I didn't have video. Okay, so the first thing that we learned is actually getting the, robotics, the robotic arm to the right place um, is something that a user won't do intuitively, right? We need to make the inverse kinematics um, of the robot realistic, but we also need to get there um, in steps, right? So what we're showing here is a few modes of operation. One is like on the left you will see uh, first person operation, sorry, third person operation, as in you're looking at the robot. And on the right you'll see um, some of our modes that were supposed to go in first person operation, but you're looking at them from a third person perspective. Because what we're trying to do there is instead of have a rope connected to the robot and tug on it, we're actually controlling the robot from the position of the arm. Um, I also have a golden rule to propose here. Um, don't make controls for VR. Just, just don't ever put controls like, like menus or stuff like that inside the engine. And the reason I say this is uh, because you'll end up making them anyway. It's just gonna be there. Complexity rises, so don't plan for that. Um, instead, what we did is we added visible motion bounds for everything that the robot does, right? So if you want to know where you need to go, you have visible motion bounds at the point that you, that, that you are moving them. Um, we also made a legal state indicator. We, I talked about that. And just as before with, uh, uh, with Isaac Domino's, we also endowed the scene with environmental storytelling. So we could tell a story of what's going on here. You're tying a pretzel, you're in like this kitchen, you have this robotic helper. The robotic helper is also giving you instructions via signs, so you don't have to have explicit instructions. Uh, and these are very important for, um, for a operator, because an operator doesn't want to feel um, criticized. They want to feel like they're inside the scene and they're learning the scene. And this gets a little more complicated than that even, because they, like most people, don't really know how to tie a pretzel. And this, that's like, that's a this surprising thing, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the wrong audience to say this. But tying a pretzel, yeah, I, I see some people making some, some gestures with their hands, right? So it's actually quite complicated. 
you need to take, you need to take a ribbon, you need to create this like sort of U shape in the middle, then you need to twist it, and then you need to take the, that knot and put it over the ribbon. And most people didn't get this. And I, I know we're all German here, so um, you all know this. Um, but for most other people, we just had to put a physical rope in the booth uh, for them to practice on. And we had to tell them, don't cheat. And what I, what I mean by don't cheat is don't cross your arms because robots can't do that. Don't use twisting operations because robots can't do that. Um, and don't do it too fast because robots can't do that either. So they would have to use both hands and pick it up and place it. And they saw how complex it is. So they were already prepared for the complexity of moving a robot because this, this thing is hard to manipulate. So some takeaways. Um, Users will always default to illegal states, you know that. Um, so we have the IK, which has an illegal state. We have uh, the gripper itself, and you know, things will penetrate because often users will put their controller through the table. That's granted. Um, the perceived scale or torque or mass of the object affect uh, the user behavior. Uh, we all know this because we're in games. If we're playing a small character, we expect it to be fast. If we're playing a large mech, we expect it to be slow. Um, so you need to make visual tools to compensate for that, right? And one of the things that we discovered is that despite the fact that we have a rather small robot, it's not very fast, right? So we need to make sure that the user understand what speed they should operate this in. Okay, um, make tutorial levels, obviously, like in games, until the, p the person understands um, the control scheme and make it easy to undo on a, mi no on a micro scale. That's pretty much all I have. Um, I'll take questions. I th yeah, I have time for two questions. Hang on, I give you a microphone. Can I have a uh, I'm sorry, I th was, that, was that too quick? <laughs> I was like, I was looking at my timer and I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, okay. thank you, <laughs> I'm good. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. First question on, uh, from my side is, did the Domino Roboter ever win? And uh, <laughs> did he use, when you tried to train him in the VR, did you already use the IA information, like um, recognizing the dominoes and so on, or was it just yeah, placing so, so, uh, a yeah. stone somewhere? So the, the, the robot, I, I don't remember if the robot won. That's like the answer to your first question. Um, I'm not sure you can really win a game of dominoes without exhausting all the playset, and we didn't have all the playset for compactness reasons, but um, the other thing is, like, yes, we used all the information in VR. This was literally a debugger. We were intervening in the state of the training, and we were sometimes rewinding the state to show uh, what we could do had the robot done other moves. 